Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Marcus Jackson. I'm a poet and associate professor at Ohio State. Um, thank you all for being here. I'm so pleased to see that we have uh, robust attendance uh, and that we are drawing from OSU community as well as other universities across the nation. Uh, today's event is sponsored by the Global Arts and Humanities Discovery theme and our new Signature Society of Fellows program. The SOF program offers OSU faculty course release to work on their research, funds graduate and undergraduate student research, and invites external speakers whose work helps us to critically engage our annual theme. Uh, the theme this year is extinction slash imagination. Extinction slash imagination brings together scholars and artists, faculty and students whose work engages histories, present realities and future possibilities of extinction. This year's cohort addresses extinction as a range of existential threats to ecosystems, species, populations, cultures, languages, and life ways. As the world faces unprecedented environmental, economic, and health-related threats, and in a moment in which a global pandemic and global awareness of racial violence and systems of inequality heighten our awareness of fundamental interdependencies, the frame of extinction slash imagination and related public events such as the DD series invites us to explore these pressing issues with an expansive cross-disciplinary framework. This theme calls for a dual vision that attends to structural and embodied relations that contour extinction, as well as the role of imagination in crafting sustainable and liberatory responses to these threats and systemic inequities. Given the size of this forum and to facilitate featured speakers' contributions, we have set studios on mute and will keep videos off other than for the panelists and moderator. The session is being recorded and will be made available at a later date on our website. The chat function will be open for comments. However, questions for the Q&A will be taken directly from the Q&A tab, which is right at the bottom of the screen there. Uh, the special topic for today's dialogue is um, settler colonialism and indigenous futures. Two indigenous writers, Ali Covey Eckerman and OSU assistant professor of English, Alyssa Washuda, will read from their work on memory, imagination, and the critical challenges of surviving the ongoing apocalypse of colonization. In addition to today's DD, Ali and Alyssa will be running a graduate workshop entitled Narrating Resistance on November 12th from 4.30 to 6 o'clock. Graduate students interested in attending who have not yet RSVP'd can still do so and can find the RSVP in the events page on our website. I'll introduce our two brilliant featured readers um, individually. And first up, we have Alyssa Washuda, who is a member of the Collets Indian tribe and a nonfiction writer. She is the author of White Magic, my Body is a Book of Rules and Starvation Mode. With Teresa Warburton, she is co-editor of the anthology Shapes of Native Nonfiction, Collected Essays by Contemporary Writers. The New York Times Book Review hails Washuda's most recent book, White Magic, as beguiling and haunting and declares that Washuda's voice sears itself into the skin. Time Magazine calls the book electric, and Harper's Bazaar aptly celebrates Washuda's brilliant ability of, quote, finding a private sense of liberation under strife. Washuda is a National Endowment for the Arts Fellowship recipient, a Creative Capital awardee, and an Assistant Professor of Creative Writing at The Ohio State University. It's a joy to welcome Alyssa Washuda to the virtual stage. Thank you so much, Marcus. Thank you for that beautiful introduction. I'm so happy to be here. So happy to get to talk with Ali today and um, to share my work with all of you. I'm going to read um, a sort of uh, 
part of an essay. It's sort of like a whole essay with lots of parts removed from along the way. Um, so it's about half its uh, half its full length. And hopefully I didn't take away too much uh, to, to make it make sense. Um, but I'm going to read something that's part of my, um, my project for the Society of Fellows. Um, and I think all you need to know is um, it was written one year ago. And um, if some of it seems familiar, it's because um, my formal constraint for drafting the essay was um, an essay of mine that's probably my, um, my most read, which is Apocalypse Logic. Um, so you'll maybe hear some echoes of that if you're familiar. This is called Apocalypse Pathology. I should also say before I begin, this is about colonization, violence, um, and other traumas. Um, so do what you need to do. Apocalypse Pathology. My great-great-great-grandfather, Thomas, headman of the Cascades, was hanged in the Washington Territory by the U.S. Army in 1856, a year after signing the Kalapuya Treaty. I don't know where he was buried. I'm not sure anyone knows. I feel like I should say I'm tired of writing about our dead. I'm always writing that Thomas was hanged a year after signing the Kalapuya Treaty. I'm always writing that his daughters had daughters who had daughters who had daughters who had daughters, one of them being me. I'm always avoiding writing about intergenerational trauma because the science keeps changing and because I never knew Thomas or his daughters or theirs, even though there is something of them in me. Actually, I'm not avoiding this. And in fact, it may be my only subject, but sometimes when I say once more that I am traumatized and my body is sick, I can feel someone thinking, God, she's back on that. From the late 1700s through the 1850s, waves of infectious disease, smallpox, malaria, measles, killed most of the Cascades and other Columbia River tribes. Something called intermittent fever, probably what we now call malaria, was the most successful at spreading among lower Columbia River populations because of the mosquitoes breeding in the waters. Stagnant swamps around what would become Portland, lakes where women gathered Wapato, and so on. The disease was so contagious and lethal that during the 1830s, 92% of the native people in the lower Columbia and Willamette Valleys died. S settlers arrived to find us mostly gone. They took the land because the dead can't tend it. And they decided that even our living were dead already. In late April, I began struggling to breathe, felt sharp pains behind my ribs, ran a brief fever, got a rash on my limbs, felt, fa felt faint while lying down and had headaches so bad, I felt like my skull had cracked. I felt sick and fatigued, but that wasn't new. My doctor said, it just sounds like a little pleurisy. But within days, I couldn't take in enough breath for a sentence. I went to the ER and tested negative for COVID-19, but after I apologized for wasting everyone's time and supplies, the doctor said she wanted to keep me overnight. I didn't understand. You seem calm now, she said, but your heart rate has been over 120 for an hour. That night, I slept in a wheeled bed with electrodes taped to my chest. Nurses visited in the night with needles. In the morning, the doctor said my heart was perfect and sent me home. After months of specialists, imaging, and blood, a rheumatologist diagnosed me with Sjogren's syndrome, an autoimmune disease marked by dryness, and fibromyalgia, a pain condition. The Sjogren's diagnosis was shaky because the blood work and lip biopsy didn't turn up the markers of autoimmunity called for in the numbered list of diagnostic criteria, but the symptoms clearly fit. The fibromyalgia diagnosis was shaky because it requires that I believe in my own pain. For unknown reasons, Native Americans have a higher prevalence of autoimmune disease and are less likely to present typical autoantibody markers for those diseases overall. 
we are dramatically more susceptible to Sjogren's than the general population. And despite the presence of symptoms, the lip biopsy and antibody tests are less likely to turn up objective proof. Autoimmune disease is not well understood. Its causes are likely both genetic and environmental. Infections may play a role. The immune system in the course of fighting something fights the body. I don't know why, I'm not sure anyone knows. PTSD may be associated. Stress affects the immune system. Autoimmune disease is different from my severe allergies, another instance of a hyperactive immune system in that the response is not to an introduced substance, but to the familiar tissue it fails to recognize as self. To check my fast heart, the rheumatologist sent me to a cardiologist who diagnosed me with inappropriate sinus tachycardia, a fast heartbeat without a discernible reason. It's not dangerous, she said, and it's most common among younger women. I am not lying for the essay when I say this. I immediately thought inappropriate pain. Words from Athabaskan scholar Diane Millian's essential work on what she terms felt theory. Native women's personal narratives, some of which are marked by this inappropriate pain, are too subjective and test resistant to be useful to settler science. The settler colonial lust for objectivity devalues feeling. The quote from Million, the mainstream white society read native stories through thick pathology narratives, yet the same stories collectively witnessed the social violence that was and is colonialism's heart. Inappropriate sinus tachycardia's cause isn't really known, but a few possibilities are an autoimmune condition, a viral infection, an adrenaline hypersensitivity, or an abnormality in the little cell cluster responsible for the electrical impulse that beats the heart. It's often misdiagnosed as anxiety. In May, 2020, soon after the hospital, I saw a neurologist who said he would first seek a unifying diagnosis, something that could explain everything. He gave up, but I keep trying. He works in medicine, I work in metaphor. Like, my body doesn't recognize itself, so it destroys the intruder of me. I'm taking myself down, organ by organ. Suntag, of course, argues that, quote, illness is not a metaphor, and that the most truthful way of regarding illness and the healthiest way of being ill is one of the most purified of, most resistant to, metaphoric thinking, end quote. Twitter supplies constant reminders of this when the coronavirus is referred to as an enemy in war. Suntag wrote about this in regards to cancer and tuberculosis, and she pointed to the language of invasion, colonization, and defenses. The NIH defines Sjogren's syndrome as an autoimmune disorder in which immune cells attack and destroy the glands that produce tears and saliva. How can I disentangle illness from metaphor when only doctors have the linguistic workarounds of jargon that allow them to avoid the metaphors fundamental to our language? Is there a way to talk about the immune system without referring to triggers or saying that cells kill intruders and destroy invaders? Of course there is, but I can't access that language. Is illness really not a metaphor if we have no language but metaphor with which to understand it? More importantly, who cares? I'm killing myself. That is autoimmunity. Some parts of me killing other parts. I have no better way to say it. Mamelus Island is the name given to multiple islands in the Columbia River. Mamelus Elahi, the original people's name, means land of the dead. In the, time, in the before times, most of our Cascades dead weren't buried in the ground. They were wrapped in tule mats and placed in, plank, in cedar plank vaults. The living weren't meant to cross through, through the land of the dead, visiting only to deliver and tend the bones. In 1851, a settler chronicling his trip west recounted, on the way we saw an Indian burial place where skulls and other bones of all sizes and ages were lying scattered about, the wagon crushing them 
as it passed along. Many of these islands were flooded by dam backwaters. During the construction of the Bonneville Dam in Cascade Territory, the Army Corps of Engineers disturbed and uncovered many bones, baskets, and adornments on Bradford Island. In 1936, the bones and objects were moved five miles to the Cascade Cemetery in North Bonneville. These unknown ancestors now lie together in a mass grave marked by a monument that reads, Ankiri Tilikum Musum, or Hear the Long Ago People Sleep. The people sleep alongside my grandparents, great-grandparents, great-great-grandmother, and great-great-great-grandmother, Susan, a wife of Tumath, a chief who was murdered by the US Army. We do not know where he is. I want, when I die, for my body to go to them because I don't want to be lost. Eight months before the last time I watched television, I was at my boyfriend's former home near my traditional territory. That visit was the last time I was indoors, unmasked with a group because I was giving a craft talk at the university. The next day, the WHO declared the spread of the virus to be a pandemic. The New York Times reported, quote, although declaring a pandemic is largely symbolic, Given that the virus has been spreading around the world for weeks, health officials hope the action will raise public awareness of the approaching danger." End quote. A WHO official said the declaration could be helpful in, a, in, quote, galvanizing the world to fight. During my visit a month earlier, Wes and I went to the campus gallery to look at photos of wilderness fires. A placard at the entrance said, the modern desire to manage fire has an operating thesis. It doesn't yet have a working narrative agreeable to the general public. It's hard for photographers to illustrate a story that remains inchoate and perhaps harder to devise images that can substitute for story. One image that does though, I should say this is not from the, was not from the exhibit. One image that does though, is the September 2017 photo of evergreens blazing behind golfers on the green, one of them captured while putting. The image went viral. It is burned into my brain. It was taken at the Beacon Rock, Beacon Rock Golf Course, two miles down the road from the Cascade Cemetery. The fire started by a white teenager who threw a smoke bomb in the forest, burned for three more months over 50,000 acres. The golfers said they were curious, but unworried. The fire was on the other side of the river. The golf course shared the photo on Facebook with the caption, our golfers are committed to finishing the round. Charles Cutley from the Lower Columbia told Franz Boas in 1894 about his grandfather's sickness and the fever that took him to the land of the dead. Not the physical one on the island, but the one the spirit travels to after it departs from the body. Quote, now his people were also attacked by the epidemic. Several died each day, sometimes three died, sometimes four. Now my grandfather felt sick. After three days, he died. The grandfather visited the land of the ghosts and revived. Then the seers learned what he had seen when he went to the country of the ghost and saw everything there. In 1825, at a fur trading post near the mouth of the Columbia, Fort Head Duncan McDougall told a group of Chinook and Clatsop principal chiefs, the white men among you are few in number. It is true, but they are mighty in medicine. See here, in this bottle, I hold the smallpox safely corked up. I have but to draw the cork and let loose the pestilence to sweep man, woman, and child from the face of the earth. The men in terror called him the great smallpox chief. In his great mag magnanimousness, the colonizer kept the bottle corked. No matter, in 1853, a smallpox epidemic killed half of us. In 1854 and 1855, Washington Territory governor swept through with treaties the chief were to X on behalf of their gutted peoples. 
turning over vast expanses of land, retaining rights to fishing, hunting, and gathering that have never been honored. After that, more smallpox. Every day of the current pandemic, one after another, people tweet, we've survived worse. For a while, I thought that if I got the right blood work, doctors would eventually figure out my affliction, pull me from my depths of exhaustion, cure my mouth sores and undo my damage. If I got enough therapy, I would release my trauma. I would be healed of my dysfunction if only I could find the answer and its corresponding therapeutics. I would like to self-care my way out of the pain, but my relentless headache is telling me that I never will. I did not build this and I cannot tear it down. My body is not land, not mappable. There is no point A or point B. There is a constellation of pain points, ancestors and world breaking events. I want to inhabit my body so fully that I know how it was built, what I'm made of, because I too am asking, who am I? Why am I this way? The blood in my veins doesn't speak to centrifuges that break it into parts. It speaks to me. In, can you hear me okay? This is, keep hearing a beep, sorry. In 1855, according to the interpreter for Chief Kamayakin of the Yakima people, Isaac Stevens told Kamayakin that if he and other chiefs didn't sign the treaty that would cede more than 11 million acres of their land and open it for settlement in two years while the people moved to reservations, quote, they would walk knee deep in blood. Sorry, I'm gonna unplug something I think might be beeping. Kamayakin signed that treaty with his ex while he bit his lip so hard that it bled. Stevens broke the treaty two weeks later, opening the land for the taking. Kamayakin went to war. The next year, he brought the war to the Cascades of the Columbia, occupied by the US military in order to starve and impoverish the Indians. The whites hid in a store owned by brothers named Bradford, while the brothers sawmill and lumberyard burned. The Yakimas left before the hanging started. Chief Chenoweth yelled in his language, I am not afraid to die. Tummuth, as far as I know, didn't say whether he was afraid. Suntog begins illness as metaphor by saying, illness is the night side of life, a more onerous citizenship. Everyone who is born holds dual citizenship in the kingdom of the well and in the kingdom of the sick. I misremembered this. My mind's version is everyone is born into the kingdom of the well or the kingdom of the sick. I've read the book twice and I still don't know what she means when she says, quote, my point is that illness is not a metaphor and that the most truthful way of regarding illness and the healthiest way of being ill is one of the most purified of, most resistant to metaphoric thinking. I don't know how to separate the metaphoric from the literal. The land of the dead is both islands and underworld a place of this world and a place of another, a place for bodies and a place for spirits. I was born into an occupied kingdom where the land of the dead and the land of the living were collapsed. Even our ways of being ill are supremely unhealthy to the whites who say we're killing ourselves. When the, um, when the Seattle Indian Health Board requested medical supplies and COVID-19 tests from the county, state, and federal health agencies, they were sent a box of body bags. Because I was born into the kingdom of the sick where illness waits, in, waits inside us to be born, I do fear the new virus. I'm afraid of long COVID, the persistence of symptoms for months, because I know the relentless torment of the mystery in me the still unexplained opportunistic infections and unanticipated welts. I have no room for more sickness. I want to say that I'm not afraid to die, 
But as Wes drove me to the hospital and we stopped at a red light while I struggled to inhale, I was more afraid than I have ever been because I fear the potency of a virus more than the force of a man. Is it allergies, the cold or the flu? Is it COVID-19 or fear? Is it my heart or my brain? In Yakima territory, as the pandemic began to kill people all around me, I gave a craft talk. I said, is the diagnosis the same as the end of an essay? In a narrative's denouement, the strands are gathered, the plot resolved. At the end of the unnamed illness to diagnosis narrative, something comes into focus and then it is named and becomes real. During the summer of 1829, four fifths of the Cascade people were killed by disease. The year before Tummuth signed the treaty, there were only 80 Cascade people left. We have known for a long time that they intend to kill us. I have spent almost every moment of my life in an America that will not rest until I am either dead or too weakened to fight. I'm trying to get well because I don't believe this is the end. I'm not even close to dying. My tachycardia barely phases my heart muscle. I could go on doing this forever. The doctor wanted to see my heart. I lay on my side while a man pressed a tool against my chest and made pictures from the echoes. For the last picture, he pressed the tool into the base of my throat and said he would shoot the sound down through the gap in my bones. When he was done, I dressed and looked at the images, expecting to recognize the core of me. The heart had no shape, only the inner voids of its dark chambers were clear. I would make a metaphor if I could, but I've lost track of the subject and have only the figure. The heart is a dead metaphor. The ancient thread between organ and emotion has worn too thin for imagery. Long ago, peoples believed the connection was literal with all emotion housed in the organ, evidenced by the way feeling made it beat. We know better. And yet my body insists on resurrecting the metaphor. My heart on beating so hard, it feels like it might be thinking, like it might be close to the answer my mind won't try to reach. That's it, thank you. Stunning work, Alyssa. Thank you so much. Now I will introduce Allie. Allie Covey Eckerman is an Aboriginal poet and visual artist from South Australia. Her debut collection of poetry, Little Bit Long Time, was published in 2009 as part of the new poet series of the Australian Poetry Center. Since then, she has produced a substantial and formally innovative body of work, including the award-winning 2015 collection, Inside My Mother. Eckerman has described Inside My Mother as an emotional timeline of the stolen generations, the thousands of children of indigenous descent, among them Eckerman herself, as well as her mother and son, taken from their families by the Australian government. Eckerman's work has been praised for its use of nature to render the beauty of Aboriginal family bonds, as well as the pain and violence of their breaking. Eckerman's other books include the prose memoir, Too Afraid to Cry, and the verse novel, Ruby Moonlight, which was named the New South Wales Book of the Year and also um, won the Kenneth Slesser Prize for Poetry. As well, Eckerman is the recipient of Yale University's Wyndham Campbell Prize. In addition to her work as a writer, Eckerman is also the founder of Australia's first Aboriginal Writers Retreat, and has edited a special, a special issue of the journal Southerly on Aboriginal writing. It's an honor to be joined today by Ali Kobe Eckerman. Ooh, could uh, you unmute please, Ali? I think you might be muted. Yeah. Um, way everyone, it is a, a extreme privilege to be here. I'd like to pay respects to Sister Alyssa 
and all First Nations brothers and sisters on your country. I'm a Yankanjara woman living on unceded Nadjuri country in South Australia. Um, today in Australia is uh, Remembrance Day and um, which has the, um, it's always the statement, lest we forget. Um, and I'm going to uh, dedicate the reading today to the Aboriginal people who fought and died um, in the frontiers, frontier wars um, and um, lest we remember. This first poem is called Thunder Raining Poison. It's a response to a beautiful art piece, a glass artwork of a uh, about a thousand yams um, that was created by um, my sister Yoni Skes. Um, and uh, it's a statement about the atomic testing on our land at Maralinga, which is a uh, Northwest South Australia. <clears throat> a whisper arrives, 2,000, 2,000 or more. Did you hear it? That bomb, the torture of red sand turning green, the anguish of earth turned to glass. Did you hear it? 2,000, 2,000 or more, yams cremated inside the earth poison trapped in glass like a museum. Did you hear it? 2,000, 2,000 or more tears, we cried for our land, for the fear you gave us, for the sickness and the dying. 2,000 years of memory here, 2,000 or more. Peaceful place, this place, until you come with your bombs, you stole our happiness with your poison ways. You stole our stories, 2,000, 2,000 or more. Our people gone missing. Did you hear it? Where's my grandfather? You seen him? Where's my daughter? You seen her? Mummy, you seen my mum? Dad. 2,000, 2,000 or more times I asked for truth. Do you know where they are? 2,000, 2,000 or more trees, dead with arms to the sky, all the birds missing, no bird song here. Just stillness, like a funeral, 2,000 or more. A whisper arrives. Did you hear it? It sounds like glass, our hearts breaking. But we are stronger than that. We always rise us, mob. We are not glass. We are people. 2,000, 2,000 or more, our spirit comes together. We make a heart. Did you see it? In the fragments, it's there in the glass. 2,000, 2,000 or more, our hearts grow as we mourn for our land. It's part of us. We love it, poisoned and all. Circles and squares. I was born Yankandjara. My mother is Yankandjara. Her mother is Yankandjara. My family is Yankandjara. I have learned many things from my family elders. I have grown to recognize that my life travels in circles. My Aboriginal culture has taught me that universal life is circular. When I was born, I was not allowed to live with my family. I grew up in the white man's world. We lived in a square house. We picked fruit and vegetables from a neatly fenced square plot. We kept animals in square paddocks. We sat and ate at a square table. 
We sat on square chairs. I slept in a square bed. I looked at myself in a square mirror and did not know who I was. One day I met my mother. I just knew that our meeting was part of my healing circle. Then I began to travel. I visited places that I had been before, but this time I sat down with family. We gathered closely together by big round campfires. We ate bush tucker, feasting on round ants and berries. We ate meat from animals that live in round burrows. We slept on, in circles on our beach, around our fires. We sat in the dirt on our land that belongs to a big round planet. We watched the moon grow to a magnificent yellow circle. That was our time. I have learned two different ways now. I am thankful for this. It is part of my life circle. My heart is round like a drum, ready to echo the music of my family. But the square within me remains. The square stops me in my entirety. Mm. I tell you true. Yeah. I can't stop drinking, I tell you true, since I watched my daughter perish. She burned to death inside a car. I lost what I most cherished. I seen an angel hold her as I screamed with useless hope. I can't stop drinking, I tell you true. It's the only way I cope. I can't stop drinking, I tell you true, since I found my sister dead. She hung herself to stop the rapes. I found her in the shed. That rapist bastard still lives here, unpunished in this town. I can't stop drinking, I tell you true, since I cut her down. Can't stop drinking, I tell you true, since my mother passed away. They found her battered down the creek. I miss her more each day. My family blame me for her death. Their words have made me wild. I can't stop drinking, I tell you true, because I was just a child. So if you see someone like me, who's drunk and loud and cursing, don't judge too hard, because you don't know what sorrows we are nursing. Mm. Sit down in the dirt and brush away them flies. Sit down in the dirt and avoid them many eyes. I never done no wrong to you, so why you look at me? But if you've got to check me out, well, go ahead, feel free. I feel that magic thing you do, you crawl beneath my skin to read the story of my soul, to find out where I've been. And now you mob, you make me wait. So I just sit and sit. English words seem useless. I know language just a bit. I sit quiet way, not lonely, cause this country sings loud songs. I've never been out here before, but I feel like I belong. It's three days now, the mob comes back, big smiles are on their face. This your grandmother's country here. This is your homeland place. We got a shock when we seen you. You got your Nana's face. We was real sad when she went missing in that cold Port Piri place. I understand my feelings now. Tears push behind my eyes. I'll sit on this soil anytime and brush away them flies. I'll dance with mob on this red land, Munda Wirral place. I'll dance away them half cast lies because I got my nana's face. Abstract. She remains beyond her imagination. No imprints mar her mind. 
Its undulating discourse forms a briny view. Large fish bones lie scattered on moist sand. A thin track cuts to the matrix below. The illusion of turquoise is centered with birth. The seawater spills a treasure of shells. At her feet, the murmur of legends crave her. One foot in water, one foot on sand. The tidal gravity keeps her grounded. Rough and ready art erupts from her. She breathes air into a dead gull. Sticking feathers into her eyes, she has resigned the human realm. She scribes patterns into her mind and naked, she executes her future. Inside my mother. My mother screams as I touch her hair attempting to brush away the coarseness with my hands, to entwine twigs filled with leaves into her locks, a tiara of green to soften her face. And our tears dry now, my mother is frailing. She talks only to those who have gone before, no longer seeing my love, no longer needing and the wailing bursts from our mouths as she sinks to the ground, her mother, the earth, my mother, the dying. Throws sand in her face, tasting the grit in her mouth and wailing louder, throws herself forward, pushing her breasts into the softness of the earth, her mother. And my mother, the dying crawls down into that final embrace. Her conversation incoherent now, as if like a child, she is practicing words for the lifetime to come. And the syllables loud and guttural spill over the sand, her mother, the earth. And I walk away leaving her there in that cradle, safely nestled in the roots of that tree, safe in her country, our solace, her grave. <clears throat> the joy, <clears throat> excuse me. <laughs> the joy of renewal. There is no greater joy than to hold your only son for the first time at the airport. He is 18 now when he returns to me and I am the prodigal mother restored. Now he has two boys and every time we play, my grandsons teach me exactly what was lost. Intervention Payback. This is a, a, a long poem. It's an important poem. Um, it's when the, the government, um, in the, it's called the Northern Territory Emergency Response. Um, about 10 years ago when the government um, had another trick to um, steal our land. I love my wife. She writes skin for me. Pretty one, my wife. Young one, found her at the next community over, across the hills, little bit long way, not far. And from there, she give me good kids. Funny kids mine, we're always laughing all together. And that wife, she real good money. Make our wally real nice, flowers and grass patch and chickens. I like staying home with my kids. 
And from there I build cubby house, yard for the horse. See, I make them things from leftovers, from the dump, all the leftovers from fixing the houses. And all the leftovers, I build cubby house and chicken house. And in the house, we teach the kids, don't make mess, go to school, learn good, so you can work around here later. Good job, good life, and the government will leave you alone. And from there, Jamal and Nana tell them stories when the government was worse, rations. Government made up all the rules, but don't know culture, can't sit in the sand. Oh, Jamal and Nana, they got the best stories. We're always laughing, us mob. And from there, night time when we're all asleep, all together on the grass patch, dog and cat and kids, my wife and me, them kids, they ask really good questions about them olden days about today, them real ninty, them kids, they're gonna be right. And from there come intervention. John Howard, he make up new rules. He never even come to see us, how good we was doing already. Mal Bruff, he come with the army too. We got real frightened, thought he was gonna take the kids away, just like Jan uh, Jamal and Nana been tell us. I run my kids in the sand hills, took my rifle up there and sat. But they was all just lying, changing their words all the time, wanting meetings today and meetings tomorrow. We was getting sick of looking at them. So everyone put their eyes down and some even shut their ears. And from there, I didn't care too much. Just kept working, fixing the housing, being happy, working hard. Kids go to school, wife working hard too. Didn't care too much. We was right. We always laughing, us mob, all together. But then my wife, she come home crying, says the money in quarantine. But I don't know why they do that. We was happy, not drinking and fighting. Why do they do that, we asked the council to stop the drinking and protect the children. Yeah, well, you know me, you bloody mongrel. I don't drink and I look after my kids. I'll bloody fight you, you say that again. Hey, settle down. We're not saying that. Mal Bruff's saying that. Don't you watch the television? He making rules for all the mob, every place in Northern Territory. He real cheeky white fella, but he's the boss. We gotta do it. And from there, I tell my wife she gets paid half, half in hand, half in the store. Her money's in the store now, half and half, me too, all us building mob. But I can't buy tobacco or work books. You only get the meat and bread, just like the mission days, just like Jamal and Nana tell us. And from there, I went to the store to get meat for our supper, but the store ran out. Only tin food left. So I asked for some bullets. I'll go shoot my own meat. But sorry, they said, you got to buy food. That night I slept hungry and I slept by myself thinking about it. And from there, the government told us our job was finished. The government had given us the sack. We couldn't believe it. We'd been working for CDEP for years. Slow way park the truck at the shed, just waiting for something, for someone with tobacco. The other men's reckon, fuck this, and drive to town for the grog. But I stayed with my kids, started watching the television, trying to laugh, not to worry, just to be like yesterday. And from there, the politician man says, I'll give you a real job, tells me to work again, but different, only half time, 16 hours. But I couldn't understand. It was the same job as before, but less pay. And my kids can't understand when they come home from school why I can't buy the lolly for them like I used to before. I don't want to tell them 
I get less money for us now. And from there, they say, my wife earns too much money. We're going to miss out again. I'm getting sick of it. Don't worry, she says. I'll look after you. But I know that's not the right way. I'm getting shame. My brother, he's shamed too. He goes to town, leaves his wife, leaves his kids. And from there, I drive round to see Jamal. He says his money in the, in the store too, poor bloke. He can't even walk that far. And I don't smile. I look at the old man. He lost his smile too. But Nana, she cooked the damper and kangaroo towel. She's trying to smile. She's always like that. And from there, when I get home, my wife gone to town with the sister-in-law. She gone to look for my brother. He might be stupid on the grog. He's not used to it. She got to find him. Might catch him with another woman, make him bleed, drag him home. And from there, my wife, she come back real quiet. Tells me she went to the casino. Their mothers took her, taught her the machines. She lost all the money. She lost her laughing. And from there, all the kids been watching us quiet way, not laughing around. So we all go swimming down the creek. All the families there together. We're happy again. Then boys, we take them shooting, chasing the kangaroo in the car. We're real careful with the gun. Not going to hurt my kids, no way. And from there, my wife, she's sorry. She back working hard, save the money. Kids going to get new clothes. I'm going to get my tobacco and then bullets. But she gone change again, getting her pay, forgetting her family, forget yesterday, only thinking for town with a sister-in-law. And my wife, she got real smart now, drive for miles all dressed up, going to the casino with them other kungas for the Wednesday night draw. I already told you, I love my kids. I only got five, two pass away already. And I'm not complaining about looking after my kids, no way. But when my wife gets home, if she spent all the money, not going to share with me and the kids, I might hit her first time. There is a void inside of me, a cavern filled with water stilled by time. When the solstice arrives, drops of sunlight seep in. Mostly the void is dark, forgotten, even in the whispers of the aged. The void is inside me. It is the imprint of my children who I did not raise, who were whisked away, the pain of their birth dulled by the pain of their removal. And my body exhausted does not respond to the anger inside my mouth, the anger that rises from maternity, centuries of childbirth adhered to nature. And I am the experiment, the other side of sensibility, the unnatural. I have become domestic, domesticated, and you ride me like a horse, tugging my head from side to side. The reins in your hand bleed the words in my mouth to silence. My eyes filled with fear, careful to watch my every step so as not to jolt you, forcing you to punish me as I have not been punished enough. The void is inside me, my retreat even from myself, as I have retreated from the natural world, dead inside, dead in a bottle of booze, liquid that soothes, running over scarred ridges inside my mouth, scarred by your hands, your responsibility of me and my responsibility to self waits. Black deaths in custody. 
Despite the cost, a new jail has been built. It seems the incarceration rates are trebling. I only came here in the role of a deaths in custody inspector. All the cells are stark and spotless. Blank screens watch from the corner. The officers have the highest technology. The faces of the staff all look the same. When I walk down this wing and peer into this filthy room, the door slams behind me. The feeling in my heart is changing from a proud strength to fear. All the stories I have ever heard stand silent in the space beside me. A coil of rope is being pushed under the door of this cell. I might just explain um, in the role of a deaths in custody inspector, that was a role into um, a Royal Commission into the number of black deaths in custody. And that commission was held in Australia in 1987. And still since then, not one police officer has ever been charged for the murder of an Aboriginal person in custody. Kumana, it's a term that we um, give our loved ones um, when they pass um, culturally, we should not um, mention their name again. We're all getting a little bit modern, um, but i uh, like to share a little bit of language and I will explain that much has been stolen from us and, um, and I am uh, relearning uh, language. Kumana. Kurumpa we are palacha, Walcha Kuchu, Kana Kulumpa, Nananina, Walchanka, Kana Puka Rinkula, Nilo, Wanti Katinya, Naiko Walcha, Nilo Wachi Upa Kulini, Nilo Wachi Larini, Walcha Ku, Wama Chikara, Nilo Reverse. Chachu Milani, Naiko Walcha, Manu Nilo Ilara, Nilo Jungani, Naiko Walcha Judah, Kurumpa Weir Palacha, Walcha Kuchu. There is no life but family. When I am young, I live with my family. When I grow up, I leave my family. When I'm lonely, I miss my family. When I'm drunk, I reverse charge my family. When I pass away, I unite my family. There is no life but family. Thank you. Breathtaking work, Ali. Thank you so much. Uh, we are gonna transition now to Q&A and I see one is already up. And it looks like this first question is for Alyssa. Um, it says, I found your critical engagement of Sontag's illness as metaphor profound and wonder um, if you see links between your position and Sontag's claim um, and Tuck and Wang's essay, decolonization is not a metaphor. Yeah, thanks. Um, first of all, thank you, Ali, for that reading. That was amazing. Um, and um, thank you, Wendy, for the question. I, I actually thought, I was thinking a lot about that, um, um, uh, about decolonization is not a metaphor when I wrote this, because um, that, you know, that, that work is really important to me. And, um, and I think it, um, it, you know, gives language to things that we need to talk about and keep talking about and not stop talking about um you know for those who don't know um i would have to pull up the the paper to get the language um accurate but um tuck and, and wang are um 
arguing decolonization is not a metaphor. It's um, not, not a metaphor, not um, a term we can just apply to things that would be nice to do. Um, I think is kind of a pretty bad paraphrase, but um, they talk about the, um, you know, the need to, um, for basically for decolonization to be focused on the restoration of indigenous land and indigenous lives. Um, and I think, you know, again, we need to keep talking about it because it is really important and it is, it's very easy to lose sight of, of what decolonization means, that it means land back. Um, and I think especially, um, you know, in our, in our uh, universities, I think it becomes, it gets lost really fast. Um, and so I was definitely thinking about that. And, um, and I don't want to take away anything from, from that argument. Um, because I think that, um, I don't know if I have like um, words that I can totally put to my thinking around this, but I guess when I was writing, I just kept pressing. Like I just kept pressing on the ideas of, um, you know, after getting that diagnosis of inappropriate sinus tachycardia and like thinking about autoimmune disease and, um, you know, also thinking about this in terms of um, metaphor and disability and, um, you know, just like how problematic language can be in that area. When I brought it into, like, when I was thinking about myself, I felt like that was a space where, um, I guess I just was going to spend some time and really look at those links between, you know, subject and figure in the metaphor. Um, and I didn't see it as being an instance where I was like sliding back and forth between subject and, um, subject and figure. I, I felt that I was seeing something that could be both at the same time. Um, and I don't think that, I, I don't think it's true of decolonization that it can be both, it, it can't be both, you know, land back and, um, you know, restoration of indigenous life and lands and something other than that. It can't simultaneously be those things. Um, I don't think. Um, and so I think it has to always include land back. Um, anyway, I'm sort of, um, my thinking is wandering off, but I guess I'll just, just wrap up by saying I was, I was thinking a, a lot about it. And I, I think that in this overall project, I'm just continuing to think a lot about narrative and, um, and storying things and thinking a lot about metaphor and subject and figure. Thank you. We have um, a question that just popped up for both uh, featured writers. Uh, what poets, writers, or artists you feel in conversation with in terms of uh, ideas, themes, form, et cetera? Hmm. A lot of my early writings and, um, and many of those poems were my early writings um, were formed being back on country or living um, uh, in an area that I knew I had a cultural um, association with um, because I'd been out there before, but this time I was sitting down with, uh, with family. And I think uh, at that time, more it was the influence of hearing um, my language, being immersed in my language for the first time, sitting with uh, uh, um, grandmothers and grandfathers, um, the Jamal and Nana, um, who um, would be holding my hand and it was felt like the pulse of the earth was um, coursing through me. Um, definitely 
in those early days, that was the major contributor of um, a lot of cathartic poetry. Um, I started writing in the four years, uh, the four year period from meeting my son, uh, my mother first, and four years later, uh, finding my son. So there was a lot of emotion and, um, and the grounding of um, my traditional people um, and country allowed that cathartic process um, to happen. Um, and I think that's important to message, uh, to mention, because um, it's important for um, new uh, writers to just write, to not be formed by anything, to be raw um, and to find their original voice. And, um, you know, I was in my um, mid 40s, so I was a bit, you know, a, a, a quite a, older than most um, new writers. And, and it was just um, falling off me like, like the shedding of an old skin. Um, but in that process, I, um, uh, I didn't realise until later that I had sort of found my own uh, voice influenced um, by my old people. Um, there are so many um, Aboriginal uh, and Torres Strait Islander poets in Australia. Um, and I hope to just encourage um, um, students to to do their own research. I think it's it's I think it's not 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 fair to influence um, that adventure. I think poetry needs to be an adventure. Um, you know, I, um, Alyssa and I shared an adventure. You know. Um, uh, Five years ago, we were at the same writers' festival in um, in uh, Christchurch in New Zealand, and um, you know you, you 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 it's your journey. You bump into people. You don't know whether you'll see them again, but it's this poignant blessing time where you're really moved by hearing each other's works and sharing. And you know if you've lugged enough books to be able to 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 swap books. And um, and and I think I um, will just you know uh, encourage um, listeners to to Google and research. There are so many award-winning um, uh, First Nations writers in Australia. We've won all the big awards. We we're, we're two three percent of the population. We're just smashing smashing um, literature, and um, yeah. Do, do your research and, and, and be amazed, be amazed because what your research actually allows the universe to give those gifts to you. And the universe always needs to be part of our journey. Human is not the, the, uh, the driver. The universe is uh, much more powerful. Um, you know, so Ali, like I, I guess it was a couple of years ago, I ran into someone, I was in Hamilton, New Zealand, and I ran into someone we met the last time we had one of these conversations, um, one of the Naitahu writers. I feel the same way that you do about that sense of adventure. Um, that was one of the best adventures of my whole life. Um, and I think, you know, I'm really interested in the ways that, you know, our work is in conversation after, you know, all this time since I've seen you, um, both of us writing about voids and um, yeah, and just other things I was struck by that we're, we're thinking about together. Um, in, and that, you know, that sense of um, kind of following the universe is really at the heart of my work. Um, I think that, you know, I so many, I don't know if I would say I am in conversation with these writers. I'm um, more listening to them. Um, 
I guess I have been in conversation with one of them, but um, that the essay I just read, I think really, I feel the presence a lot in that of um, my friend Deborah Magpie Erling, who uh, is um, a writer that I, I met years ago and is just a, a huge influence of mine. Her novel Perma Red is, um, is, you know, one of my very favorite books of all time. And the way that she writes about land and um, the way that she handles the unsaid um, and, and violence and, um, you know, and sort of like menacing forces, I think has been really profoundly impactful to me as um, have our, you know, literal conversations. Um, and um, also James Welch. So the, the essay, the longer version of the essay that I read um, has a lot of um, passages from an analysis of Winter and the Blood by James Welch, as does the, the essay it took its form from Apocalypse Logic also um, is you know quoting Winter and the Blood. And I think that that, that book has just really impacted me quite a lot in, in thinking especially about metaphor and motif and you know the ways that fish show up in that book like just a totally confounding motif there's so much mystery in that book and there's so much that is incredibly difficult to interpret and I just love the refusals of that book and the invitations of that book, like the way that it is, it's so short. And the first time I read it, I did it very quickly. And I thought, I don't know what just happened. I think something happened that I was not paying attention to. And I've just always, since reading that and rereading it and rereading it, I've always wanted to write something that, that offers that kind of invitation. Thank you both. Uh, we have another one, another question for both of you. Uh, sensation in the body was woven throughout both of your work, opening up your audience, readers to vis uh, visceral empathetic response. How would you say your body comes into play in your research uh, or creative or writing process? And if at all, how does the body relate to land back efforts for you? In our cultures, the, we don't own the land, we belong to the land. So we're part of the land and um, we can feel the land. And I think the most um, First Nations people, when they're standing on their traditional land, oh, it's, um, it's a powerful thing, but it's also powerful when you feel uncertain if you're traveling through country, that may be the place of great sadness, of massacre or, or brutality, or it may be a sacred place that you shouldn't enter. Uh, it's very important to learn to listen um, and, and to know your body and to listen to your body, all that is, all that that we need is contained within us. And we live in a, in a colonizer society that doesn't, um, that doesn't practice that. I was very, um, you know, blessed when I met my mother and was in the, um, in, in the desert that I had, you know, 10 poignant years with, with the senior people before they passed. And even, um, not, not being able to understand with language and sometimes they'd be excited and forget to translate. And so I just learned to watch with my eyes and my heart and, um, and I could see, I could see their connection to country because these were people who had been born traditionally on country um, and were, you know, were, were eight or teenagers when they first uh, saw um, white people and came into the missions um, deep in the desert. And um, it, was such a, it was such a privilege. It was the best university in the world. 
I miss them terribly, but they can still live within me. The body is everything. Um, I hate that commercialism and all these other needs um, trick our children and, and, and will trick us all um, to listen wrong way. Um, you know, we had, um, I think all, all, all First Nations people, all Indigenous peoples around the world had this wonderful other way of listening and honouring the body. You know, I'm thinking about, um, again, I, I have to paraphrase badly because I don't remember the quote, but um, in her book, As We Have Always Done, uh, Leanne Batasma Sake Simpson talks about um, Indigenous bodies um, as adva advancing nations and especially being perceived as advancing nations and being a threat to colonialism. Um, and so I think that it is, you know, um, I think that, you know, indigenous life and indigenous land um, are, yeah, are, are inseparable. Um, we have such old, like long, old relationships with our land, you know, in, um, you know, along the, the Columbia River and the, the Cowlitz River, um, my different ancestral lines have, you know, agreements with the, um, with the salmon that go back thousands of years, um, or we agreed, uh, they agreed that we could eat them. And um, that's our treaty with the salmon. And it's so, you know, it's just so old and complicated. I've been thinking about it and talking about it a lot this semester as I talk with my native literature students um, about land and about, you know, how we bring place into our work. Thank you for <laughs> more amazing answers. Um, let's see, we have, uh, a few, we might not get to all of these, but I'll just go in the order that they popped up. Um, a question again for both. Uh, so now to think about the, the perils of the colonized publishing world. Uh, what are some challenges that indigenous writers face in the publishing industry? Well, many, um, you know, I mean, the publishing industry, first of all, is just, um, I, I was just thinking a lot about it today about how um, impossible it's become for writers and readers generally, like the proposed or the, the merger they're trying to make is what it, Penguin Random Simon House or something. Um, like just all of the big publishers are gonna merge into one. Um, and that's almost happened. So, you know, I think that um, the, there have been so many, um, I think things are getting a lot better uh, for indigenous writers in the publishing industry, but you know, for a long time, it was very hard for writers to break in, um, especially to the big houses. It was, it was nearly impossible. Um, and you know, I've, the rejections I've gotten, the rejections I've heard about are appalling. You know, I, I um, like, you know, yeah, I don't know, I won't share them, but it's just basically things like, you know, um, that the publishers like expressing that they had already satisfied uh, the need to have their tokens and um, could not take on any more, uh, you know, that the publishers, uh, you know, editors and agents saying things to the effect of, you know, they, they can't, um, can't identify with my protagonist, they couldn't get close enough to my protagonist, who's me, you know, um, and, uh, you know, they, uh, they didn't, and there's lots of like language about, um, 
how agents and editors need to love the work in order to take it on, which makes sense, you know, but um, there are, I don't know of any indigenous editors at the big five houses. I don't think there are any there. I know of some people who are um, in, you know, um, like intern level roles, which is great, but um, we're not represented. And there are just so the, the representations have been so profoundly shaped by Hollywood um, that that's, you know, what the general public is often expecting. And there's so much, you know, this, I think this, this happens in so many areas of the writing world that um, there's this sort of like push to do what readers are expecting, which I don't understand because I want to be surprised. I want to I want to be surprised and I want to surprise my readers. Um, they don't always like that. Some readers do, some readers don't. We all like different things. Um, but I think, you know, that there for years publishers just were not taking a chance on on us and we're you know we're getting books by native writers that were not you know the indian they were looking for um i think you know that is definitely changing it's like noticeably dramatically changing and that's that's great but it's still really it's still really hard um and there's still there's still some of that and there's still no native editors I think um, similar in Australia, we have one small um, indigenous publishing house, Magabella Books. Um, they were the first um, publisher of Ruby Moonlight. Um, um, they're, they're amazing. A lot of white staff because there aren't um, many um, First Nations um, editors and um, publishers but um, their board is uh, First Nations and that makes the difference. Um, so, you know, we need to get on these boards. That's one way of, um, of, of changing it. Um, I haven't um, published since Inside My Mother. Um, um, and I probably will not publish with um, someone who can't come to my house and have a meal. There needs to be a certain um, friendship and 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 trust, uh, um, and uh, f for the future of of my um, publishing, um, because I ref sort of refuse to um, to risk being in that token position or um, be forced to have a difficult conversation um, uh, and to um, water down my work for the sake of um, publication. Um, yeah. Um, I think, you know, the onus is on the readers, readers can have a have a um, a sway here too, if readers are buying the books because publishing houses are in the um, you know in the business to make money, and so if the readers are, um, if 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 the sales are showing something, there'll there'll be a response. I really um, um, appreciate what Alyssa said. You know, don't don't stay with the normal. Be, be excited, be adventurous, you know, um, be brave. Thank you. Um, it looks like we're at our time limit. Um, and I do want to apologize to those folks who posted questions who we couldn't quite work in, but thank you so much uh, to both of our amazing uh, groundbreaking writers, uh, Allie and Alyssa. And here is Wendy Hesford. Thank you again and claps on my end. Thank you for a terrific dialogue. And as several have commented in the chat, it really has been an honor to hear you both read and talk about your work. I myself am very thankful actually for the space that you've provided us today. 
space of both critique and also contemplation. So thank you. But thank you all again. Thank you as well, Marcus, for stepping up and reading my welcome when my internet was unstable. I really appreciate that as well. Thank you all. Have a good evening. <laughs>